This is the second and concluding part of the presentation on cost of capital. In the last section, we showed that there are three conventional methods for estimating the cost of common equity. They are the bond yield plus risk premium approach, the capital asset pricing model approach, and the third, and yet to be discussed, is the dividend discount model which is the same as the dividend, the discounted cash flow method. And we proceed to that method right here, which shows that based on the constant growth formulation, we can find the required rate of return on a firm's common equity, which is the same thing as the cost of common equity, in this fashion. So we need to know what the current dividend is, what the um, growth rate is, what the current stock price is, and then with those, we, in this example, find the firm's cost of common equity to be 16.3%. Now, keep in mind that common equity could either be generated internally in the form of retained earnings or externally through the sale of new shares of common stock. So, if the firm's common equity comes in the form of the sale of new shares of common stock, then we must subtract the flotation cost involved from the price. And so in this example, after factoring that in, the flotation cost, which comes out here to be 12% of the price, we find the firm's cost of common equity to be 17.57%. So as you would imagine, cost of common equity, when it comes from the sale of shares, would be more expensive for the obvious reason that the firm is having to pay flotation costs. Nevertheless, we must bear in mind that when common equity is generated in the form of retained earnings that there is an opportunity cost associated with that so even though the firm hasn't gone outside to sell anything or to pay anybody any commissions to obtain the funds the required rate of return on internally generated common equity is the opportunity cost involved in the investing in the investment of that money so in this example 16.3 percent represents how much the firm would earn if it were to invest that money elsewhere in um, a comparable project in terms of risk now the task though in using this constant growth model if I go back here is obtaining G the growth rate so typically the growth rate refers to growth rates in the firm's earnings at dividends there are also three methods to estimate that. One is to use historical data. Two is the sustainable growth approach. And three, simply look up the consensus view uh, among analysts that follow that particular stock. So here's an example. Over the past 14 years, we generated these uh, historical earnings per share data. So with this earnings per share data, we can estimate growth rates. The first would be the compound growth rate right here. So we're going to link the most recent earnings per share with the um, earliest earnings per share and find the rate at which it has grown, in this case, over the past 13 years. So this is the uh, compound growth formula. You simply solve for G, all right, to find it to be 14.78%. EPS 14, if I go back here, that's it right here, $1.20. And then EPS 1, which is the uh, most recent, uh, which is um, the earliest, is this guy right here, 20 cents per share. All right, so that's as simple as that. The average growth rate would call for you to find the year to year growth rates and then take their average. So if I go back, that's how the second one here is obtained, would be obtained actually. The most rigorous though is the log linear regression approach. In the log linear regression approach, we're going to do a logarithmic uh, transformation of earnings per share and then we're going to regress it on year and your years could be in calendar years or it could be in such a logical order we just want to know the rate at which earnings per share has been growing so here I show it on Excel alright so to get the natural log I show you here the formula already is the natural log of each of these values and then we're gonna go to we're gonna run a regression by going to data data analysis choose regression and OK all right let's clear our previous work so we're not confused 
and then we click here while cursor is blinking in the input Y range we go to the top of the file our Y is the natural log of earnings per share and click here for X while cursor is blinking there we choose year beginning from the word year highlight all of these and then check labels and check output range and check right here while cursor is blinking here you choose a spot on the spreadsheet where you wish to post your data like right there and when you click there it registers right there so you click OK now here's a finished product already that you see here here's the most important thing the uh, slope of the line which comes out to be 14.93 percent but this assumes continuous growth which is what happens when you do a logarithmic transformation. So now to remove the continuous nature of the growth rate, first of all I reference the slope down here, we're going to have to do the anti-log which is the the uh, base of the natural uh, base of natural logarithms to the power of this value right here. So to get this value you use the exponential function equal exp open parenthesis and then you click on this you close parenthesis. So this actually is equal to 1 plus the growth rates which I, I note right, right there. So subtracting 1 from it we find it to be 16.10 percent which you can see embedded in this. And that's really it. That's the logarithmic um, method of finding the growth um, rate of any economic variable actually. So going back here to our PowerPoint that's summary of the output right here and that's the calculation of the growth rate right there and other methods for estimating growth rates are the sustainable growth model and analyst forecast sustainable growth says if a firm can assure a fairly steady return on its equity investment and uses a constant dividend uh, has a, a constant dividend policy requiring that the firm reinvest the same proportion of earnings in other words your dividend payout ratio is constant in this example 40 percent which means that your retention ratio would be constant at about 60 percent so it, by multiplying your retention ratio by return on equity you obtain a sort of internal growth rate in this example 10.8 percent assuming these data right here the third is analyst forecast which you can find from published data and again I'll show you one place that you might find such data on the internet let's go here and go to Yahoo Finance in Yahoo Finance why don't we go uh, stick with uh, Kellogg's type in the stock symbol K if you don't know the stock symbol just simply go ahead and um, type the name of the company now when you type it right here on the sidebar look for analysts estimates there you have it you'll see a bunch of analyst estimates but importantly if you go toward the bottom you will see here growth estimates and under growth estimates you can see what analysts are predicting for the next five years so K is Kellogg's they are predicting that the firm's earnings will grow um, at about 7.68 percent right there and um, compared to industry of 14 percent so you can see and then this is the sector and this is the market at large under S&P 500 so you can also base it on this if you wish if you're carrying out an, an empirical study or a corporate analysis so these are examples of how to pursue this purpose so finally you put it all together to f calculate your weighted average cost of capital now to calculate the weighted average cost of capital a couple of things remember we need to know the capital structure the WD and WE so WD is the debt ratio the question is how do we obtain this well one way to do so is to base it on book values book values you go to the balance sheets I just went back on the slide right here and you identify the investor supplied capital which would be banknotes short-term debt that is long-term debt and common equity these are the investor supplied sources of capital we're gonna use these uh, 
data to perform our calculation, tax rate of 30%, cost of debt of 7%, and cost of common equity of 10%. So going forward again, the investor supplied capital would be total debt of 100 million, which comprises uh, short-term debt in the form of bank notes of 20 million and long-term debt of 40 million. If I go back here, you see them right here, right? Bank notes of 20 million, long-term debt of 40 million. All right, and then common equity is 40 million. If I go back here, you see it over here. Common equity is common stock of 2 million and retained earnings of 38 million. Combined, 40 million. So with that, we find their proportional amounts. Plug and play to find WAC to be 6.94%. Now though, there's a, the problem with using book values is that book values are kind of dated. I mean, this is just simply reflecting the balance sheet structure which may have uh, been uh, created several years ago when investors uh, put in two million bucks and the firm borrowed several years ago, $40 million, et cetera, et cetera. So use book values don't quite reflect current reality on the ground and so for that you want to you prefer uh, you should prefer the firm's market values all right so the use of market value capital structure as I show here is one that reflects current prices in the market if the firm should go out now to sell new bonds or to sell new shares how much would it cost and then based on that we determine the capital structure this example the firm's Short-term debt in the form of bank loans has a rate of 10%. The firm has 40,000 bonds outstanding. Each bond has a face value of $1,000. Coupon rate is 8%. Maturity is 18 years. And the yield to maturity, which is the market interest rate, is 7%. And coupons are paid semi-annually. The firm's stock is selling right now for $70, and there are 2 million shares outstanding. So now, Going in over here, first we find the market value of debt. Again, using the approach I showed you, you have to identify the cash flows first, which would be the coupon payments and face value. Second, the maturity, which in this case 30, 36 semi-annual periods. And finally, in this case would be the required rate of return or the yield to maturity. Since you are calculating price, the third variable would have to be the yield to maturity, which here is 7% divided by 2 to get 3.5% since you're assuming semi-annual dividend payments. So plugging and playing, this is the price of the bond, 1,101.45. Multiply it by the number of bonds, 40,000. This is the total market value of the bonds. Now though, the firm has bank loans in the amount of twenty million dollars. Bank loans are short term in nature for the, for the most part and therefore their market values are not going to change much from what they were a few months ago to maybe a year or two ago and therefore we usually use them as is. So we're going to take the twenty million in bank loans and add it to the market value of uh, bonds to find a total market value of debt to be sixty four million and some change. So then, how about equity? Simple. Price per share multiplied by number of shares. And in this example, 140 million. Put it all together. The proportion of the total uh, market value of debt and equity, which is 204 million. The proportional amount of debt is 31% and equity is 69%. Based on these input data, we calculate the weighted average cost of capital for this firm to be 8.42%. So this really wraps it all up. The only one more thing that you want to know is that in the case of common equity, we showed that there are three methods. You have a choice as an analyst to use one of the three methods or to average them out based on your best opinion as to what would provide you with the most realistic picture of the firm's cost of common equity. This concludes this presentation. I am Pat Obi, Professor of Finance, Purdue University, Calumet.